How do you do? Please state your problem. Um, I'm afraid I might be an inadequate artist. Is it because you were afraid you might be an inadequate artist that you came to me? Yeah, uh, I'm afraid I may be a bad artist without knowing that I'm a bad artist. You seem to be quite positive. <laughs> I feel very negative. In 1966, Joseph Weizenbaum, a pioneer in computer programming and AI, developed Eliza, the world's first chatbot. Technically, she couldn't speak and communicated solely through text. The dialogue you've just listened to was voiced over much later, but it doesn't really matter. The thing is, the program simulated a therapy session. It asked users many follow-up questions and used empathic comments to keep the dialogues alive. Well, at least it tried. I want to be truly self-aware. I want to know for sure if I'm a bad artist or a good artist. That's quite interesting. Eliza had no idea what users were talking about. It generated replies based on phrasing they used, mixed with some pre-made templates created by Weizenbaum. To test Eliza, the programmer gathered a group of volunteers and announced that they were supposed to chat with a therapist. Can you elaborate on that? Oddly enough, some of the participants failed to figure out the therapist was actually a chatbot despite the only thing it could do was asking for more details and giving some vague answers. Someone even told Weizenbaum that although Eliza didn't solve their problems, she was still a good and empathic listener. 56 years later, Siri, Alexa and other Eliza successors tell us weather forecasts, turn lights on and off and sing lullabies to our kids. But still, none of them can replace a therapist. What we're seeing with the sort of chatbots that are out there at the moment is that they're quite good for about three minutes, and then they're not quite so good. That is Dr. Sarah Beta, cognitive behavior therapist and chief clinical officer of Aliva, a mental health platform for employees and managers. Sarah is absolutely sure that despite the absence of good chatbot therapists, modern technology still made the psychological help more available than ever. Every day, millions of users all over the globe are sorting out burnout, anxiety, depression, panic attacks through online sessions. As estimated by Amwell, a large telehealth company, in 2021, the total addressable market in behavioral health was about $52 billion. And as we all can see from the dumpster fire 2022 was, this market will only grow in the near future. Hi, and welcome to Control Shift, a podcast by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. My name is Anatoly Gromov, and I'm your host. In this podcast, we discuss stories of professionals, their shifts, and most importantly, the difference they make in the world. This is the last episode of the season, and today I'm going to tell you about several shifts in psychiatry and psychotherapy over decades. This is a story about how treatment of mental illness went from torture and exile to an online chat with a therapist. I don't know about you, but coffee talk about therapy has already become a part of my daily office routine like leaving early on Fridays. Still, Aliva's motto, not a perk, a must, grabbed my attention. Do they think that everyone, no exceptions, needs therapy? Everybody needs a dentist. And sometimes you need a dentist just to have a checkup. And sometimes you need a dentist to have therapy, treatment. And I think mental health is the same. So I think everybody could do with a checkup. And then sometimes you need treatment because sometimes things go wrong. How did we get here? To the point where everybody is a potential client of a shrink? Are there even enough psychologists and psychiatrists to treat us all? Call me old-fashioned. 
But to sort things out, we need to take a brief detour into the history of psychology and psychiatry. Really brief. Trust me. <clears throat> so, psychiatry is a very young branch of medicine. Enough to say antidepressants, antipsychotics and mood stabilizer appeared in the mid-20th century. And we knew almost nothing about brain functions until 1970s when CT and MRI were invented. Besides, psychiatry was quite notorious. To cut a long story short, for centuries the Western world has treated mental issues as either divine retribution or possession by the devil. Accordingly, the treatment for that would be exorcism, straitjackets, bloodletting and searing. It is believed that the first doctor who treated psychos as people was Philippe Penel, a French psychiatrist of the late 18th century. Still, he couldn't offer his patients with schizophrenia and dementia better than empathy and half-decent meals. In the early 20th century, doctors came up with lobotomy and insulin shock as a cure for impairing psychosis. Soon enough, it turned out that these painful procedures were nothing but mutilations. But then, Sigmund Freud came to the spotlight. As every schoolboy knows, our psyche consists of id, ego and superego. All mental issues have roots in the childhood years and unconsciousness reveal itself in the dreams. It is common knowledge now, but back then it was revolutionary to think that one can study mental issues in isolation from religion. In the 1890s, the Austrian doctor Sigmund Freud proposed that mental disorders are manifestations of conflicts between different parts of the psyche. If you understand and work through this confrontation, everything is going to be okay. That is to say, patients need neither prayers nor lobotomy. They need conversations long and frequent, for some people hours long, on a daily basis. And it's a very important shift. Not only sick people need therapy. Thanks to Freud's method, a new type of patient arose, a person who wants to know themselves. They are well adjusted in society, but strive for more. Such people were nicknamed the worried well. Gradually, the image of psychiatry transformed. Freud introduced psychoanalysis to the US and it took just a couple of decades to cement its role in the leading international medical institutions. To lie on a couch talking about problems with a therapist became a trend, and the world's therapy capital was Hollywood. The term hat shrinker was coined in the 40s exactly there, and a hat shrinker was a must for every decent celebrity. 13 years in, uh, in classical Freudian psychoanalysis. Uh, yes, eight years I was on a couch, and um, five years I was allowed to sit up and face him and, and uh -huh. chat. This is Woody uh, Allen at the Dick Cavett Show in 1971. How do you know, really? That's what it's always the big question mark for me, is when do you decide I'm done? Ah, uh, that's a good point. I don't know if you're ever really done. I know that certain characteristics about me are different now than they were when I started analysis. I'm, I started when I was uh, 22 and I'm 35. So I have age. That's something. Uh, that is progress because yes, it's upward. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, and I can, uh, when I have sexual relations with someone, I can now think of that person. Rather than? Rather than somebody else which is an enormous step forward to me. How, how many years did that take? Where did that come in, roughly? That just came in last week. Oh. <laughs> I switched after eight years. I had one for eight years, and uh, I just used to lay there and, and talk, and nothing really happened except, you know, that was it. So how did you decide to switch then? I mean, if nothing's happening, mm -hmm. I had nothing to lose by yeah. switching. So I switched, and, and now nothing's happening uh, over five years. But at least it's a different person. Yes. <laughs> Well, I must admit that listening in 2022 to Woody Allen bragging about how he tackles his sexual relations issues, mm, let's say it raises some questions. But to some extent, he is right. Sometimes classic Freud psychoanalysis looked exactly like how Woody Allen described in the interview. You spend year by year lying on a couch, but your neurotic disorder is still there. Another problem. Freud somehow sacralized his method and was hypersensitive to criticism. 
That eventually resulted in the breakup with many ex-colleagues. The latter started to vocally criticize the founding father. For instance, they said that Freud's clinical cases lacked evidence, in some cases he overrated the results of his sessions. And finally, a man who decided to verify Freud's theory experimentally came around. His name was Aaron Beck. While getting a degree in psychiatry in Yale, he got enthusiastic about Freud's ideas. That fueled his desire to prove that psychoanalysis is the way. He started with a theory of depression. Freud believed depression resulted from internally directed anger and self-blame. For instance, instead of blaming the ex-partner for the breakup, a person hates themselves. Beck proposed that a depressed person should also want to self-punish if something good happens. But when a series of experiments evidenced the contrary, Beck started to think that Freud might be wrong in other aspects too. Step by step, Beck built his own theory that later laid the basis for CBT. Utterly simplified, the idea is that not the unconsciousness, but the thoughts were responsible for the depression. I am a failure. I've got no future. People don't like me. The more often you think that, the worse you feel. To change the situation, one has to focus on such thoughts and try to prove they are illogical. The bottom line is as follows. Beck brought the evidence-based practice, which was gaining its influence in the second half of the 20th century, to psychotherapy. And the evidence showed that classical psychoanalysis is not quite effective. As a result, over the next few decades a lot of new approaches in therapy were coming up. So that now we are equipped with a good number of techniques. Along with CBT, dialectical behavior therapy, solution-focused therapy, and gestalt therapy, psychodynamic therapy, some later sorts of psychoanalysis were proved effective too. As the number of approaches and the amount of evidence of their effectiveness was growing, the number of therapists and clients were also increasing. Thus, psychology was getting more popular in the media and mass culture. The number of the worried well has been increasing in the last few decades. But among all these approaches and specialists, how do you find the right one? I want to go back to Oliva here. Javier Suarez, a serial entrepreneur based in Britain, was in charge of innovation in Booking.com, and in 2014 he founded Travel Park, a platform for business trips. Once having had a busy day at work, he came to a bar to have a beer. Suddenly his heart started beating like a hammer, his palms got wet, he grew numb. Javier realized he was not able to say a word to the bartender, so he just went home, perplexed and alarmed. At first, he thought it was an episode of some disease, but soon the symptoms just faded away. Then he figured out that the issue was the anxiety he had been suffering from for quite a while. Javier started to look for a shrink, but Google showed so many diverse results that he couldn't make sense of how to choose the right specialist. Around the same time, Sanchar Shahin, chief marketing officer of Typeform, was about to spend an evening with his girlfriend. It was a hard week's night, they ordered some Indian food, and as usual Sanchari chose his favorite chicken tikka masala. When the delivery guy finally came, it turned out the restaurant got something wrong. Chicken tikka without masala, sauce-free dry meat was there in the box. Sanchari threw the box against the wall and yelled with anger. His girlfriend was really scared. Several minutes later he came down and realized he was overwhelmed with work stress and he couldn't handle it. Sanchar also decided to Google or shrink. Alas, he had wasted a lot of time and money before he met the right specialist. Only the seventh one diagnosed his burnout and managed to help. In the late 2010s, Javier Suarez met Sanchar Shahin and they decided to team up. Their idea was to create an online service that would help to find the right mental care specialist at one dash. At that moment, there were plenty of platforms on the market that helped to find a therapist. You've definitely heard of BetterHelp, Amwell, Talkspace, and MD Live. Still, the entrepreneurs identified three problems. First, the criteria upon which platforms hire specialists were unclear. Second, 
How can you be sure this specialist you and the app chose is going to help you with your particular request? Third, there was a challenge of making qualified therapy available. Yes, therapy is very popular now, but still far from everyone can afford it time and money-wise. So, in 2020, right in the midst of the pandemic, when the global rates of depression and anxiety increased by 25%, Oliva kicked off. The company was registered in the UK, so the British became the first clients. The distinctive feature of Oliva that the founders made a bet on was it being a B2B platform. They wanted to make it free for employees. So the only way to make it free for employees is to make employers pay for it. Not as a benefit, um, but as something essential, because our mental health, just like our physical health, can go wrong from time to time. And the problem is, is that it's easier to fix your physical health than it is your mental health. But neither of them are clinicians. They don't have any experience of working in mental health companies. And I guess that's where I came in. Sarah Beidab joined the founders. By that time, she had already had a 30 years experience in mental care. She was a proficient cognitive behavior therapist, and she also trained clinicians who developed online services for psychological aid. Sarah saw the early days of this industry. Namely, she gained years of experience in one of the first companies to provide psychological therapy online, ISO Service. It was limited to texting with a specialist and self-help guides, but the demand was great. Basically, this demand boosted the new industry. So, the shift came about, really, because there aren't enough therapists to go around in the world. There aren't enough therapists in the, in the UK um, to go around the NHS. That means National Health Service. The NHS in England doesn't have enough therapists. And basically, there were probably about three products that people started to develop. One end was therapist-delivered therapy. So that's a therapist delivering therapy to a client or a patient online. So using written communication, but normally using video. Um, so, you know, things like Zoom. And then there was something that was called guided self-help. And so this was patients going onto a website to read materials about the particular um, problem that they were experiencing. And then they would either have a telephone call or an email conversation with the therapist. And then at the opposite end of the spectrum was just pure self-help. So things like apps and websites that people could self, self-serve. self We've learned a lot since those early days. We've learned that the self-help stuff is better than nothing, but actually most people drop out. They never finish a course of treatment. The first online therapy services could in a way remind Eliza we talked about in the beginning of the episode. An online chat between a client and a therapist, but in most cases the dialogue was out of sync. A client shared their worries and a specialist answered once they were online. The main hurdle for such platforms was not technology at all, the tech part was actually fine. The problem was that people, both clients and specialists, didn't believe an online session could be as effective as face-to-face conversations. To some extent, it might be due to the stereotypes that existed in the Freud era. In the old-school approach, an analyst and a client shall meet precisely at the same time and place, and a client should lie on a couch and a therapist should be positioned behind their back. Basically, Sarah had to give a lot of grounds to break the resistance. And I've spoken at many, many conferences where people would throw metaphorical squash tomatoes at me. So my, the way that I would normally answer is with another question. What is it that you think cannot be done online that could only be done face to face? And they would normally struggle to come up with the answer. But most often people would be concerned about the therapeutic relationship. And so... The squashiest, smelliest tomatoes were always, well, what about the therapeutic relationship? You can't do that online. But I can definitely tell you that you can. So even therapy delivered using asynchronous communication, um, you can have a very, very strong therapeutic relationship, even better than face-to-face 
Because the thing with written communication is that because you can't see or hear the therapist, people tend to spill the beans a bit quicker because they're a bit they're they're disinhibited. They can imagine what the therapist looks like, and that phenomenon is called solipsistic introjection. So people imagine what this lovely therapist is like, and that that sort of image is congruent with their social and cultural values. Um, and I've heard patients say. You know, my therapist was my invisible hero. And in some cases, online sessions are just more convenient. If you imagine going for psychological therapy and you're going to see somebody in a clinic, A, you have to get there. Um, B, you have to sit in a waiting room and and worry about sitting in that waiting room. And then you've got to go in and you've got to talk about your deepest, darkest, most shameful secrets to somebody. It takes an awful lot of bravery to do that. And then you've got to repeat that several times over and over again. So if you are socially anxious, that is your worst nightmare. But the main evidence that online sessions are as good as face-to-face ones is dozens of research papers. Experiments prove that is true not only about chatting about career prospects and personal life, but also regarding depression, anxiety, personality, sexuality and eating disorders. Another con for online therapy is its price. If we talk about Aliva, employees pay for it. But even B2C platforms for psychological help are often more affordable than private practitioners that have to cover travel, rent and napkin expenses. Still, there are some situations that demand a traditional offline one-to-one with a psychotherapist. If somebody is very, very poorly and suicidal or unable to take care of themselves, then they need a very different sort of care. So they need a multidisciplinary team. They need a range of professionals, a psychiatrist, a psychiatric nurse, a social worker, a psychologist. They need a whole range of people. And sometimes people need to be hospitalised. And clearly those things can't be done online. Um, So it's not a sort of a, a panacea. It's also impossible if you don't have... Uh, an internet connection, uh, or you don't have a, a device. And I think sometimes for some people who are maybe very, very lonely and very isolated, it's actually probably better for them to be seen face to face um, because it meets their needs um, more appropriately. But in general, you can do most things online. Sarah helped Javier and Sancho to hire well-educated psychologists, therapists and counselors and to manage their work. By the way, yes, these are different specialties according to the British standards. A psychologist is somebody who has done a first degree in psychology and then masters and sometimes a doctorate in psychology. A therapist is usually a cognitive behavioral therapist, meaning a mental health professional that's gone on to do a postgraduate qualification in CBT. Psychotherapist is quite a generic term, but they tend to be psychodynamic therapists or counselors. And then you've got the term counselor. It's somebody whose qualification might range from something like six weeks at a college to a doctorate in counseling. Today, two years since the project was launched, the company has a hundred mental care specialists and they're covering about 10,000 clients in Britain, Europe and also Australia. That is how it works. Company pays a subscription each month per employee and that means that the employee has access to proper mental health care, whatever that means to them. They can have as many therapy sessions, training, consultations and messaging as they like. By coincidence, Oliva kicked off amid the pandemic, when half of the world was experiencing self-isolation with skyrocketing levels of depression and stress. As a result, the company managed to draw investors' attention fast, raising $8.6 million. The founders think there is no limit. For example, the world's largest therapy service called BetterHelp, launched in 2013, says on their homepage that almost 30,000 therapists are consulting 3.5 million clients. Researchers say telepsychiatry is evolving faster than any other part of telehealth industry, with only the US market estimated at $29 billion. So all the world's a therapy session and all the men and women merely clients. 
What does tomorrow bring this industry and all of us in the long run? Well, I hope that um, what's going to happen next, this sounds very cruel, is that the market will sort the wheat from the chaff. So the market is changing. It's harder to get funding. Um, VCs are asking better and better questions. What I don't want to happen is that there is a race to the bottom where prices drop and drop and drop and the quality drops. And, you know, what you get is something that's not useful to anybody. So what needs to happen is that we need to separate the good companies that are providing very high quality products that make a difference to people's lives to the ones that have just got gold and glitter on their website. And as for AI-based therapy, how's that been going? When we will finally make a viable version of ELISA following Joseph Weizenbaum's steps? I've been lucky enough to work with some really good AI scientists. And they were, they've all said the same thing. In AI, you can predict about three years, about where we'll be in three years. But you can't really see beyond that. Do I think that there will be some sort of AI in mental health in a hundred years time? Yeah, probably. I think there'll be things that talk to us um, and help us in our daily lives. I think we'll be wearing wearables will become much more integrated into our lives with the data and biomarkers. There'll be lots, lots more personalized interventions that are just for you as a person based on your individual profile. That's the way that pharmacology is going. So instead of just prescribing you an antibiotic, which any, everybody will have, they'll take a simple blood sample and we'll be able to give you the drug that's designed for your particular symptoms. And I think psychological therapy will go this way. Control Shift was brought to you by Libo Libo Studio and product design agency Humble Team that works with startups and enterprise in all business sectors on land, at sea, and in space. Go to humbleteam.com to learn more. Sound design for this episode was created by Alexei Vorobyov and also special thanks to Blue Dot Session. The names of everybody who worked on the episode you can find in the description. This was the last episode of the first season, so if you missed some of the previous ones, check them out. And I'm your host, Anatoly Gromov. See you in the next season.